Last week, Naoma Finn asked me to collaborate with her on a podcast, and I did it because I love working with her. The video, I think she just dropped it yesterday. Today is Monday, March 21st. Uh, She uploaded it yesterday morning. It's called Warning. Don't go in the swamps. You might not come back. It is one of the most fun videos that I was able to do. I'm kind of jealous she's writing all of this stuff on her own and doing such thorough research. But I'm going to end screen it. It's going to be on the end screen and in the description. And I'm going to put it up in one of those little cards. If you guys want to break away and go watch it, go over there and tell her what a great job she's doing. I'm so proud of her. She uh, was a little apprehensive about starting her own channel. And I'm like, girl... You got it. You got it going on. Get over and get your own channel going, girl. And she did, and she's having a lot of fun with it. So go over there and tell her what a good job she's doing. I mean, I'm really proud of her. Okay, enough of that. Welcome to the Dixie Cryptid channel. My name is Cameron Buckner. I've got two, one really good, uh, you know what? It's two or three stories, all kind of from one email. And then we've got another email that's kind of a, theory based on this story i think it's kind of interesting and i think you guys are gonna like it so let's do it all right here we go here are a couple of stories i received from a man in canada he wants to be anonymous i think these are interesting for two reasons one He's in the woods all the time still. He's been in the business a long time. He's in the timber business. He's a forestry contractor. And two, he just seems real honest and unassuming. And I think that lends a little credibility to his story. But let's get into this. I think you're going to enjoy this and find this very interesting. I want to share my experience in Chetwind in 1993. I worked for a forestry contractor based out of Prince George. We were working helicopter contracts being flown in daily for patching clear cuts that had failed their first effort to replant several years before. The first few days were without issue, and a few guys working the limit of the clear cut claimed to have seen some tracks in the mud. I saw a few, and they were way larger than my size 14 foot. The rumors started to make the rounds and the guys who lived in the area, which is British Columbia, thought nothing of it, like it was normal to see these giant tracks. The guys who came from the east in Canada tended to be more skeptical, and they mocked the rest of us. But a few days later, we noticed that some of our tree planting shovels had gone missing. This went on day after day, and our boss was furious. Replacing lost shovels for workers when they are flown in by helicopter to inaccessible areas is a big freaking deal. We didn't have access to a local hardware store. Our boss said, whoever's doing this better knock this shit off now. Not only will you lose your job, I'm going to turn my back and let the guys who are now unable to make money have their way with you. We were all terrified of being labeled as the thief while simultaneously suspecting the guy we liked the least as the culprit. At any rate, the shovels kept disappearing, and soon vehicles were being vandalized. It quickly became apparent that none of us were doing this. The more the work slowed, the less money we made. All of us were angry to miss out on the income, every one of us. And still the shovels kept vanishing. At the base, the trucks were having large stones thrown at them and breaking out windows. Those were stones that we struggled to roll or lift, and the damage done to our trucks was like these stones were launched from a cannon. The damage was extensive. One truck that was new only two months prior was in fact written off or totaled. We didn't see anything, and we didn't hear anything, at least not there. But I also know that no one flew their own personal helicopter in each day to steal our $45 shovels, 
and each person on my crew stayed the whole season, so it didn't appear that there were any dissidents among us. I can't say it was a Sasquatch, but then I don't know of too many other possibilities. I don't know any animal that I've encountered in my 46 years in Canada that would steal shovels or launch a 50-pound stone at a vehicle. Whatever kind of being did this had dexterity and it acted with intelligence and stealth, all the while maintaining a constant presence that 50-some-odd guys never detected. Was it a Sasquatch? I haven't seen one of these beings face-to-face, but I have lived alone in the woods and at times with a few others off-grid for five years of my life in British Columbia, northern Manitoba, and central Ontario, hundreds of miles from the nearest towns. In addition to my Chetwind experience, I have seen tracks and I've heard calls that I can't place, and I have viewed tree origami that just doesn't make sense given the general accepted catalog of North American animals. I don't want to take up more of your time. I just thought I'd share these things. If you ever had more questions, please email me. Dude, you're not taking up my time. This is what I do. Uh, He goes on to write, My wife and I are headed back to British Columbia to travel and camp and head up to the Yukon and Alaska next year, and I can't wait. My heart is in those woods. Given my occupation and work, I need to ask that my name not be revealed. I wish it were otherwise, but I know you have a keen interest in these things, and I wanted to share this with you. Well, that's his first experience, and that's that's quite fascinating. You know, a bunch of guys work in the timber industry, all of them have shovels, and all of a sudden these shovels just start vanishing. Why would anybody steal a shovel and take, you know, they're just costing themselves money, and then the rocks being thrown through the trucks. But he has another story. This one is not Bigfoot related, but it is fascinating. A matter of fact, it's way better, not better, but it's it's way more interesting to me than his first story. And you're going to, I think you may agree with me. He writes, I'm taking some lunch right now and also taking a much needed break from some internal audits my company performs. And I'd like to share another experience I had. This one occurred just weeks before the initial experience I previously shared with you. It doesn't fall into a typical cryptids or UFO story, but it's actually more frightening for me because to this day, I don't know what happened, nor does the guy who was with me. My former brother-in-law, John, and I left Winnipeg early April of 1985 to head to British Columbia to work for the summer near Chetwind. We decided that we would drive through the day and night on this 24-hour journey and take some stops along the way, even though it would make our trip more like 36 hours long. My 1984 VW Golf was packed to the roof. I'm sharing this because it will be pertinent later in the event. We left Lloydminster, Alberta at roughly 2.30 after an uneventful first day of driving. After driving all that day, we had both hit our second wind and drove rather than resting despite the late hour and having been on the road over 12 hours at that point. We were traveling west on Highway 16, which in Canada is known as the Yellowhead. In these parts, there are not a lot of people and we would pass another car maybe every half hour at best. There's just not much doing in these parts during the day and absolutely nothing at night. To keep ourselves going, we had the windows rolled down for the cool night air and had some of our favorite tunes playing on my stereo, and we smoked a few good cigars just to pass the time. I remember changing the song on the stereo and glancing at the time. It was 3.45, and we still had an hour and 45 minutes to Edmond, Alberta. What happened next I can only describe as if my life was like an old real film that someone cut seven hours of time out of and spliced it back together again. Because in a flash, seven hours of time that we would not have otherwise known went missing except for that it was now clear daylight and we were not on the highway. One minute I was driving and the next 
I was in the hatch of my car, with my body pressed into the roof, laying on my back, upside down, and looking backwards out the hatch with my face pressed against the glass. I called for John again and again to help me, because I was stuck. I would later learn that he was upside down, his upper body in the footwell with his head wedged behind the center console. I kept calling to him to help me and open the hatch because there was no way that I could get out otherwise. I was pressed in there in a way that defied any logic. Eventually, John got to the back of the car and he helped me out. We were finally free and both of us standing next to the car and we gazed around confused for several minutes. We only stared some wild-eyed glances at each other. I offered him a cigarette, and we sat in what we now realize was a field of mature wheat with no highway in sight. I glanced at the time, and it was 10.30 with the sun shining bright. Finally, after finishing a cigarette, I said, I don't know what just happened, but I want you to take a piece of paper, and we're both going to write down what we can each recall since we left the most recent gas station in Lloydminster. After doing that, we compared notes and shared exactly the events that I just shared with you. We then looked around and saw a gravel road not too far away. The soil was bone dry so I could make it out in my VW Golf, and in doing so it dawned on me that we were ruining this old mature wheat as we drove out, but astonishingly had not made any visible path getting to this spot. And with this, I started to shake. And when John looked over at me and saw me shaking, he saw what I was seeing. The realization that we had been placed in this field was shocking. He started to cry, I suppose, out of fear. And then it sank in that we just lost seven hours of our lives. It went from night to day and highway to a random field in the blink of an eye. I followed the gravel road and it led me back to Highway 16. And for a moment, I thought, okay, maybe I just went off the highway and passed out. Now this calmed me for a moment. And then I saw the road signs and I realized that we were now back east 15 kilometers or nine miles from where we were last. To explain this more clearly, we were traveling in the same place we were driving the last 10 minutes before we went blank. Now, we were more freaked out than ever, and I pulled over because my foot shook so much to drive a steady throttle, and I looked over the car. There was not a spot of damage to the car, and we were not hurt or disturbed in any way that we could tell other than our car was nine miles backwards from where we left off in the middle of a wheat field with no tracks leading to where my car wound up. And then seven hours of my life had vanished. When we arrived in Prince George at corporate headquarters, we checked into the medical clinic. I feared I had some mental episode or we had our drink spiked or something, but both John and I checked out okay. We passed the required toxicology screening for our employment. John and I have run into each other occasionally over the past 25 years, and we both recall the same details to this day. I have no idea what happened to me and John, and in being brave enough to share a few times with others, we have only faced ridicule. I'm not prepared to say that I was abducted by something, but I also know that what occurred was not just me falling asleep at the wheel. I really don't know what occurred that night 25 years ago. In later years, I would learn professionally that this world is not what we think we were raised to think it is. I look forward to the day that I can speak on that more clearly. Keep up the good work, Cameron. I really like your format where people can feel they have nothing they have to prove. and They can just share. We and they are not crazy. and Society is programmed to make us feel scared of being labeled and mocked as such. Have an awesome afternoon, Cameron, and he signs off. Woo, man, was that a cool story? And I know he's scratching his head still today trying to figure this out. But, oh my gosh, I just love these stories. I 
It's so amazing to me that these things actually happen to people. I believe this. You know, we've been talking about true stories, not true stories, vet the stories, blah, blah, blah. I believe this story. I have no, this, he gives me a resume of his education and his work experience that I didn't share with you because it was, uh, he wants to be anonymous and somebody might figure out who he is, but he, this guy's a smart guy. He knows how to study. He knows how to achieve degrees. He knows how to work with his hands. He's out in the woods. He grew up working out in the woods. He loves being alone in the wilderness. He is everything. He's a real smart, blue-collar, white-collar kind of man. He's written a good story, and I believe it. The time loss event may be one of the most fascinating things I've read on this channel. Okay, this is an email that uh, it's not a story, but it's real interesting to me, and I thought I would share it with you guys. And I appreciate the folks who send me these emails with their theories, and uh, it's as good as a story to me, just as good as a story, and I love reading them. This one was so good, I wanted to share it with you. I won't give you the writer's name because he doesn't say whether to or not, but, um, and he's talking about missing people, the 411. I think that's what it's called, 411 Missing People. Uh, it doesn't mean we can't appreciate his point of view on this. Here's what he writes. Whatever methods are being employed against these victims, one thing is becoming clear. There seems to be an intelligence behind it. As David Pilates has stated, whatever is happening here has a 100% success rate, implying that there are no substantiated reports of anyone successfully repelling or escaping the phenomena once it begins. Of course, if this were just a random natural phenomenon occurring in nature as part of the environment by forces we've yet to understand or prove through science, then it would happen seemingly everywhere and with plenty of eyewitnesses. But that just doesn't seem to be the case, especially when the victim reappears inside of a metal water tank with no apparent way for a human to gain access to its interior, indicating an attempt to, as the mafia would say, get rid of the body. I am, of course, referring to the Elisa Lamb case. How this was done is unknown, but might be explained as having been phased through the metal or teleported into the interior. Either way, it smacks of something right out of Star Trek, the use of technology to manipulate the environment to better succeed in its effort to complete its task. Okay, I'm going to stop right here, and I'm going to, for those of you who don't aren't familiar with the Elisa Lamb case, um... I'm not sure. I've, okay, it says right here. I'm just going to read this little clip that I clipped off the internet so just to get you familiar with the Elisa Lamb case because it's uh, it's real interesting. Matter of fact, there's a documentary either on Netflix or HBO where I saw this, but it's fascinating. Uh, and it happened in the Cecil Hotel in Los Angeles, which is uh, reportedly got a bunch of weird stuff goes on there. But Elisa Lamb, to this day, nobody knows exactly how Lisa Lamb died. We know that the 21-year-old Canadian college student was last seen at the Cecil Hotel in Los Angeles on January 31, 2013. But the infamously chilling hotel surveillance video that captured the bizarre final moments before her disappearance, let alone the other details that have emerged since, have only elicited more questions and answers. Ever since her body was discovered in the hotel's water tank on February the 19th, her tragic demise has remained shrouded in mystery. And this article is very long. I actually copied the whole thing, and it's a... Uh... Anyway, just Google uh, Elisa Lam, E-L-I-S-A-L-A-M, I think you'd be pretty interested. If you're into the true crime, mysterious disappearances thing, you might be interested in that. But back to this man's email. One piece of evidence to support the idea of intelligent design being that it appears to be very selective in its timing when people go missing, such as when they are in a group or waiting for one victim to get too far ahead or too far behind, is the deciding factor being the person who disappears is momentarily out of view of the others. 
Another is when bodies are found in an area that's been searched multiple times. It can't be determined if the culprit is aware of the search efforts and returns the victim to the spot of, insert whatever term you like, simply because it had departed the scene temporarily and then later returns to the scene to drop the body off? Or conversely, it was there the entire time, observing the search and waiting until there's an opportunity to do so. Why this is done is a mystery. Is it an act of compassion to grant closure for the rest of us, or simply a tactic to discourage or eliminate any further investigation into the disappearance? The body is found, and the search ends, and we go on about our normal lives, none the wiser. Or perhaps, more sinisterly, sinisterly, is this action a way of giving us a big fat middle finger by stating that it can do whatever it wants and there isn't a damn thing we can do about it? Further still, it might suggest a complete and utter disregard for human beings in that, for whatever reason, a human is needed or wanted. People are taken and then simply dumped where and whenever the task is completed. Like lab rats, we are used for some purpose, and if, when that proves to be fatal, like refuse, the body is simply discarded. Either way, the latter two are very disconcerting. Surely the agency behind this appears to go out of its way to employ stealth and remain undiscovered. So why are clues often left for us to investigate? Clues such as the bodies themselves or clothing that is neatly folded and left behind, but without any evidence of trauma or violence. If it truly wants to remain hidden, then why leave any evidence at all, especially when it seemingly possesses the ability to instantaneously snatch anyone at any time without being witnessed? Perhaps the rationale being it doesn't take into consideration our deductive reasoning and our compulsive determination to solve a mystery. But then again, it may see itself as so superior to us that it simply may not care. If we assume it is some form of intelligence perpetrating these events, then we have to see and call it for what it is. Abduction. I say abduction because it is done on a small scale, in that there usually tends to be only one victim at a time and perpetrated in such a way as to remain deliberately hidden, i.e. remote locations, forest, and in the case of urban locations, when the victim is alone and out of view. Both of these factors indicating a thought press involved, a psychopathic thought process. But this is not what we categorize as typical alien abduction. One might even go a step further and call it being hunted. If people were disappearing in mass and from not so discreet locations such as city streets in broad daylight, then another word would be appropriate and of course mass panic would ensue for certain. But the compelling nature of the methods behind this mystery mirror our own actions while hunting. The hunter enters the forest, he's camouflaged, and is quietly positioned in a manner where the hunted, such as the deer, is unaware with the weapon at the ready until boom. Typically, with what we have come to term alien abduction, when a person is taken, they are returned for the most part unharmed, and any memory of the event is non-existent. Only through nightmares and or hypnosis, the events may be recalled. People often describe various entities that we as society have come to recognize and categorize as the typical greys, reptilians, mantis, insectoids, and even blonde-haired Nordic types. But again, these apparent races tend not to kill and will even communicate with the abductees. Their involvement with us is a topic for another discussion. So, on the surface, who or whatever is doing this is something new and or different. I mean new as in not yet part of the public consciousness and possibly not even alien in nature. 
In the rare cases where the missing have been found alive, they are unable to give any description as to their whereabouts and any events that occurred during their time missing. This in itself implies a classic alien abduction, but since they are so rare, while at the same time meeting all of the other criteria as laid out by David Pilates, to warrant inclusion on the unexplained disappearance list, it is not difficult to exclude the involvement of the aforementioned aliens and to begin formulating alternative ideas as to what is potentially occurring. At least in cases of alien abduction, people often report positive experiences such as the impart of knowledge that might better mankind or warnings of potential planetary crisis and how to cope with or avoid them, cases of technological information being provided, and the healing of illnesses. And despite the overwhelming evidence of breeding and genetic experimentation, while itself is unpleasant, it never seems to end in permanent disappearance and death. Indeed, in these cases, it seems to be in the best interest of the abductors that the abductees remain healthy and alive for future encounters. Not so with this phenomenon, apparently. Whitley Stryber once said when asked, how do we know if they are good or evil regarding alien encounters? His answer has always stuck with me. And I think he quotes it from the Bible by stating, By their actions, you will know them. Simple and direct, but then the truth often is. Whatever is happening regarding unexplained disappearances, as investigated by David Pilates, it is something different. It is outside the scope of what we identify as alien abduction. In other words, who or whatever is doing this is clearly malevolent and lacks any good intentions or even simple respect toward us. Like lab animals, we appear to be nothing more than a means to an end. What end can only be speculated? However, in a strange twist of art imitating life, there is of course the report from a woman bow hunter who was out there in her tree stand late one afternoon and who, according to her description, witnessed a humanoid shape in the woods moving through the tops of the trees. And though not completely invisible, like the predator from the movie of the same name, it was completely see-through and only visible because of a distortion causing a slight displacement effect around the edges of the interloper of the underlying foliage. What adds credibility to this story is that the woman is the wife of Dr. Bruce Maccabee, a noted physicist, and now... UFO researcher and former optical data analyst for the U.S. Navy Surface Warfare Division. Furthermore, a little research has turned up an interesting fact that the screenwriter of that film, James E. Thomas, based much of the movie on an account taken in Vietnam during the war that has been declassified through FOIA, a Phoenix team disappeared and was found skinned hanging from trees The spec ops guys they sent for rescue disappeared and were found in the same way. Also, incidentally, he grew up in Bakersfield, California, which is not at all that far from as the crow flies from the larger cluster of the missing 411 disappearances in California. So if we analyze and collate the available facts and evidence as compiled by the missing 411 investigations, and we embrace the axiom posted by Sir Arthur Cannon Doyle, when one eliminates all other possibilities, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. With the first story and the disappearance or the displacement of the two men in the car, the seven hours of lost time, I thought this would be an interesting letter to read The man who wrote me the letter is uh, a good writer, and he's obviously very uh, knowledgeable in this missing 411 phenomenon. I don't know what that is, and I'm going to be honest. I, I I haven't read a single one of those books, and I probably should. Matter of fact, talking about this topic has got me interested in it, and I may pick one up and see. uh, I'll just start with the first one. I think Pilates has several of them out. 
I actually met him at the Gatlinburg Bigfoot Conference. What the, what they call that? The Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference. By the way, we're going to be there this year. I think it's toward the end of July. I'm not sure exactly what day. Nance with Buckeye Bigfoot and I have uh, booths right next to each other. But uh, I met him there, and of course, I walked up and I said, Hey, my name's Cam Buckner. And he just kind of looked at me kind of funny, like, why are you telling me your name? I don't know. He's, he doesn't seem to be a real personable guy. Maybe he is. Maybe I just misread him. But uh, he's an interesting man. He's written some good books, obviously, and they sell tons of them. Uh, I think I looked at some of those books on, I don't think they're even available in Kindle. Any, I'll, I'll just have to look and see what it is. All that said, I hope this was informative and thought-provoking because this lost time, missing people kind of thing, it's real. It really is real. I think, for me, it's worth digging into and becoming more educated on. I'm just a, like a rodeo clown in here just reading these stories, and I ought to dig into something more deeply and get uh, knowledgeable on it. And this letter the gentleman wrote is uh, kind of sparked my interest, so I think that's what I'm going to do. All right, I'm going to quit talking. I hope you guys have a good weekend or week. I appreciate you listening to the podcast, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks. Thanks.